the audience, if you've not met, if not Kevin Roberts, executive director of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, Policy Foundation. As I like to tell people, like we are not just building an organization and trying to make sure that we keep Texas, Texas with great policies passed by the legislature, by the legislature, and you know, that real far fetched idea of getting Congress to do something good. Also, saying we're always happy to welcome friends, both. Personal friends as well as organizational friends. For many of us here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, there is no better source of analysis and reading than the American Conservative American. This organization, this work with TDGF, Texas Public Policy, is the largest policy group outside Washington, D.C. And in order to get them that large, we have to do not just the typical things that think tanks do, white papers and legislative advocacy. We also have to stop we also have to stop and actually and actually. And that requires one of the sources of thinking and analysis thinking and not worth spending time and effort. And it goes without saying that we have the American conservative. we have in our communities. And if there has ever been a year in our lifetime which reminds us that that is true, that conservatism starts in communities, in relationships and friendships, 2020 certainly is that. So it is my job tonight merely to welcome you. It's always a privilege to do that on behalf of all of us here, because before you would consider that we're a conservative organization, I hope you would first note as you walk through the door, we are a hospitable organization. It is the spirit of Texas and the spirit of America to have you here, certainly friends from out of state. I will turn this over to my friend Emil Dope, the Vice President of Advancement Programs for the American Conservative, who is doing some excellent work. And if I happen not to see you again this evening, thanks for being here and know you should never be a stranger. Come back and see us often. Take care. All right, well, thank you, Kevin. Um, thank you to all of you at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. We are thrilled to partner with you on this event. Um, all of us at the American Conservative are, are great admirers of your work, so keep it up here in, uh, in, in Texas. Um, I think it's especially fitting that we're having this event here in Texas. For those of you who may not know, uh, the mission of the American Conservative is to advance a Main Street conservatism. This opposes unchecked power in government and business, promotes the flourishing of families and communities through vibrant markets and free people, and embraces realism and restraint in foreign affairs based on America's vital national interests. We pursue this mission through our print magazine, our heavily trafficked website, our podcasts, uh, fellows program, and internships for aspiring young leaders, and, um, and conferences and events like the one that you're attending this evening. I'm very excited about the conversation that we have lined up this evening. For it touches on something that I think conservatives of all stripes and, and really uh, anyone of goodwill um, will be forced to grapple with very soon, if not already. Rod Dreyer, who's here with us, our senior editor at the American Conservative, has written a really important new book, Live Not By Lies, A Manual for Christian Dissidents. And we'll have uh, books for sale after the event in the lobby. This book is about how we can resist the coming soft totalitarianism of the progressive left. And I know that Rob will go into detail um, in just a little bit here about what exactly soft totalitarianism means. Um, but I think the response to the book alone, it's now a New York Times bestseller, speaks to its relevance for our current moment. Now, I will admit that uh, when Rod first told me about this book a little over a year ago now, um, I was a little skeptical about the thesis and about the, uh, the relevance of the book. Um, of course, at that time, we had cancel culture, political correctness, and all other sorts of, of wokeness. But this soft totalitarianism thing seemed a little dire to me. But then, of course, 2020 happened. And this terrible year that we've all endured here has brought us a rate of social change not seen in recent memory. Identity politics descended on all aspects of our lives, especially this summer. I live in Northern Virginia. The uh, Washington Redskins are no more. The Cleveland Indians now have announced that they're gonna follow suit. Um, and the woke left has long surpassed the call for Confederate monikers and monuments to be taken down. 
They've now moved on to our founding fathers and even Abraham Lincoln, who obviously, you know, <laughs> had his presidency um, defined by the fight against slavery. Technology and consumerism hasten the possibility of a corporate surveillance state. And the ongoing COVID lockdowns simply leave us even more vulnerable to manipulation. All of this has proved Rod prescient and me wrong. And of course, it makes me wonder whether Rod was the one funding all of these riots this summer to sell books. Me and Mr. Soros are like this. That's right, yes, best friends. So there's much, much to discuss this evening, and I'm thrilled that we also have James Paulos with us to help unpack it. James is executive editor at The American Mind, which is perhaps one of the most important websites trying to, to unpack what's going on on the right right now. Second, of course, to the American Conservative. Um, and James, too, has long seen the cultural currents at play. He has described a pink police state, an informal arrangement in which people will surrender political rights in exchange for the guarantees of personal pleasure. It seems to me that this is the ideal environment for the soft totalitarianism that Rod describes in his book. So I wanna thank you all for joining us both here in Texas and online. I wanna thank the Texas Public Policy Foundation for being such generous hosts. And I especially wanna thank Howard and Roberta Amundsen for making this event possible. And with that, I will kick things over to Rod. Thank you everybody for coming out tonight. And thanks to everybody who's watching online. I got the idea for Live Not By Lies back in 2015 when I received a phone call from a physician who uh, we had a mutual friend and the physician said, I need to tell somebody what's going on. He said, my elderly mother lives with my wife and me. She's an immigrant to this country. She was born and raised in Czechoslovakia and spent four years in a Czech prison in the 1950s for practicing her Catholic faith. And she's saying to me now, son, the things I'm seeing happen in the United States remind me of what things were like when communism first came to my country. And the doctor was really rattled and felt like he had to tell somebody. Well, I, I listened to him and I listened to him respectfully, but I thought, you know, my mom is kind of old and she watches a lot of cable news. Maybe this is just an old woman getting really nervous. So I contacted this couple I know, the uh, friends in the UK, in Cambridge, Bela and Gabby Bolabash. The Bolabash is defected from Hungary in the 1960s, and Bela went on to become a mathematician at Trinity College, Cambridge, and became one of the world's great mathematicians. He's retired now. So I wrote to him and Gabby in Cambridge, said, look, this is what the Czech woman said. Is there something to this? And Bela wrote back right away and said, absolutely. I said, Gabby and I are sitting here in our retirement every day, reading the papers, watching TV, and saying this is all like our youth back in Budapest. And I said, so what form is this taking? He said, well, primarily it's the idea that you can lose your job or be completely ruined in the public square for crossing the left. He said, you don't know what you can say and can't say, but the thing you do, you have to know is that they will lie about you to ruin you. This is exactly what it was like for us growing up under communism. So once I knew that people I knew and trusted said, yeah, this is happening, I made it my business to, every time I would travel to a conference or to give a speech in the next few years, and I would meet somebody who grew up in the Soviet bloc, I would ask them the same question. Are you seeing things here that remind you of then? They all say yes. And if you talk to them long enough, they get really mad because they say that Americans won't believe us. Americans think it can't happen here, but it can. So that was the genesis of Live Not By Lives. In the book, I, the first part I talk about how, uh, what forms this, what I call soft totalitarianism is taking, and James and I will talk about this. In the second half, I, it's basically storytelling, me uh, interviewing people in the old country and the, the countries of Central Europe and also Russia who resisted communism. I interviewed a bunch of Christians, uh, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox who resisted communism, trying to find out from them how we in America should prepare for what they believe, and I've come to believe, is coming here. Um, so uh, what's interesting though, when I started writing the book, I realized my friend James Polos here, you got to it before I did. You wrote an essay a few years ago about- What's that? It was a close race. Yeah, well, you wrote an essay about something you call the pink police state. 
which sounds a lot to me about what I'm calling soft totalitarianism. Can you explain what the pink police state is and maybe talk about it in terms of my book where it intersects with what I've, I write about in Live Not By Life? Sure. So, you know, the um, climb into the time machine with me and let's go back to uh, <clears throat> 1998, uh, different world before uh, software ate the world, as they say. Uh, back in 1998, uh, artists were still functioning in the popular culture as Marshall McLuhan said they did as our early warning system. Uh, people who could tell us what kind of technological trauma was going to be visited on us before it happened because in some way they had given their lives to sort of exploring the frontiers of, uh, of human encounter with uh, what had already happened, but people didn't quite understand that yet. Uh, so there I sat in, uh, in the upstairs college dormitory of a fraternity brother of mine. Uh, this was Duke University in the late 90s. So, you know, not everyone in a fraternity lived up to the stereotype. This was a guy who, you know, braided his goatee and dyed his hair and drove a, a Volkswagen bug covered in stickers. Oh, yeah, a frat guy? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> his, uh, you know, his father had his name on one of the buildings, uh, but he basically <laughs> sat around as a classic scholar and wrote uh, essays on the evolution of zombie films in America, that sort of thing. So there I sat um, watching, uh, watching uh, MTV, as you do. Um, and uh, the, the new video from the new Marilyn Manson record was being premiered on MTV. So for those not in the know, this is sort of like the last great shock rock musician, very theatrical, very glam, sort of straight line from David Bowie. Uh, but much darker and um, <clears throat> and oracular in some ways. Uh, you know, Bowie was big into uh, sort of describing what the electric experience was for people. Uh, you go through, you know, any of his later records, and uh, it's all very much drawing these analogies between electric technology and the kind of psychological state that that people were entering into, experiencing very uh you know space oriented seeing the world as as one globe uh you know uh comparing the sort of technological experience of electricity to uh the freak out of the 60s and the 70s Those so what was two manson things. doing yeah so what manson was doing um is you know he portrayed himself in this video as an otherworldly being that was sort of lost on planet earth uh, sexually androgynous with this sort of mismatched set of, of equipment that had had everything sanded off, um, you know, in some ways uh, presenting as very beautiful and other ways very ugly, you know, after all this guy named himself after Marilyn Monroe and Charles Manson. Uh, and one line in the song uh, in the video jumped out at me and it was cops and queers make good looking models. And I had one of those moments where, you know, you have that kind of head check. Am I just like, am I 19? So this matters to me too much. Like what's, <laughs> what's going on? Uh, but as the, as the years went on, you know, this little seed continued to grow in my mind and what I interpreted it as being, I haven't had the opportunity to discuss this with Marilyn yet. Um, although yeah. we did have, well, we had a, a cordial meeting in the Chateau Marmont a couple of years ago and I thanked him wow. for his service. Um, <clears throat> So what was being presented, uh, I, I came to understand, was, uh, was an onrushing future in which the aesthetics of transgression and the aesthetics of enforcement were being brought together in a new way and sort of unified into a new ideology that was very American. Uh, you know, I'm sure that you could, you could speak for hours on the way that this played out in the experience of the folks you interview uh, in a very old world, very continental key where transgression and enforcement somehow became unified. And that was kind of the essence of That doesn't make sense to people. You know, the idea that, that uh, transgression should be the sort of thing that if you transgress, then you're violating all boundaries. But there's this weird thing where people today, so many people, uh, progressives, want to be able to transgress, but they also want to be able to have control. And that's one thing the pink police state talks about. And I talked about live not by lies, but how do you explain that, uh, that seeming paradox? Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, the catchphrase of the pink police state sort of, you know, pin that I put in this, in this concept was designed to capture the way in which uh, somehow the, the logic of, you know, not, not saving the world, but queering the world had become unified to this logic of one single uniform standard of enforcement 
in, in not just across the world, but in public life as well as in private life. And so the public and private distinction goes away. And what replaces it is the distinction between official life and unofficial life. And so the pink police state becomes this apparatus that in, in one way is <clears throat> very welcoming, sometimes even demanding of certain kinds of transgression to smash the old order and to break up all the sites of resistance, whether they be churches or families or state and local government, uh, you know, many, many sites of resistance to that kind of leveling uniformity that is also a perpetual revolution at all times. Yeah, that, uh, one of the trouble some of the trouble I have trying to explain my concept to people is when they think of totalitarianism, they think of the Soviet Union, they think of George Orwell's 1984, uh, where conformity was enforced by the state on people by, uh, by virtue of pain and terror and imprisonment. But that's not what we're talking about here. I tell them that this is much more like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, where conformity came by manipulating people's pleasures and their status. So uh, you have in 1984, you have the showdown between Winston Smith and O'Brien, the torturer, who is trying to put so much pain on, on Winston Smith that he conforms and says two plus two equals five. He, he buys the lies. But in Brave New World, you have the showdown between Mustafa Mann, the world controller, and John the Savage, who's the dissident. And Mann says to him, why don't you like this world we're inviting you into? You can have all the sex you want, you have porn, you have drugs, you have every, every pleasure possible. And uh, he calls it Christianity without tears. Why wouldn't you accept this, says Mond. And Smith says, well, I want sin, I want God, I want love, he wants humanity. And uh, he, he's willing to accept suffering for the sake of being free. And Mustafa Mann says to him, not, oh, I'm going to kill, we're going to kill you now. He says, you're welcome to it. I think that is the thing, the totalitarianism that we are preparing ourselves to accept. A totalitarianism that, as you say, if you give up, you give up civil liberties, you give up free speech, you give up conflict and anxiety for the sake of having all these things taken care of. I think people, uh, middle-class people in this liberal capitalist democracy are preparing themselves, whether they realize it or not, to accept this kind of servility. Well, you know, we're not in 1998 anymore. We're not even in 2008. Uh, you know, if you go back to the, the glory days of Barack Obama's reelection, when we were going to sail into the Sargasso Sea of the end of history and just float placidly for all time, sunning ourselves, uh, the MIT Tech Review um, had a cover story uh, as soon as Obama was reelected. Uh, it's got Bono's face sort of, sort of consuming the entire cover of the magazine with his signature sunglasses and his earring and uh, how big data will save politics, right? right? Um, and it's going to, you know, the thing that's going to revitalize democracy is going to be this new technology. Uh, the old technology of the television that used to be, you know, the, the thing that captured the imagination and was really the vehicle by which uh, that those who imagined and imaged things in the most expert way ruled the world. Uh, and they were seen to rule in a legitimate way because there was no more powerful technology. Uh, that era had come to some kind of consummation. And so the, you know, the, the, the most expert and um, imaginative among us in the TV age uh, had created this thing called the internet and it was going to connect us all in a global village and uh, and the liberal project was going to be completed and uh, it was it was uh, the, the, we were going to rise to the sunny uplands of this new era and it was all about the, the right people having the right data in order to, to purify or sort of consecrate in a secular way. And that happened. Politics. That happened, yeah. For about one second, right? <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and then just four years later, um, these, these wonderful machines, these invisible robot masters that we had loosed upon the world to bring everyone together in harmony gave us Donald Trump and gave us Brexit and gave us Bolsonaro and gave us Orban and gave us the end of uh, politics in Italy as we knew it. And suddenly there was this wave of populist and nationalist sentiment 
that had secretly been bubbling up online, um, hiding in plain sight. And so uh, shortly after uh, the Trump era began, the MIT Tech Review put out a new cover story. Um, and it was complete fear margaring. How did this go so wrong? We couldn't, who could have imagined? We were gonna control said, them. That's right, we had it all figured out. Um, and now we have these same people who are so certain that they'd figured out social credit version 1.0, which was social media. And now they wanna do a great reset. And now they wanna do social credit 2.0. I'm glad you bring up the social credit system because I think that that is the way if we have social uh, soft totalitarianism in this country, that's the way it's going to come through an American version of China's social credit system. And if you don't know what the social credit system is in China, the government collects data constantly, hoovers up data from the smartphone use and the internet use of all of its citizens, runs it through the algorithm, assigns each citizen a social credit rating. If you have a high rating, that means you're a good citizen, you can be trusted, you have all these different privileges. You have a lower rating, that means you're a deplorable and you have much less access to society and the economy. What's interesting about this is it is constantly being updated. A lot of people there in China actually like it because Chinese society, civil society was destroyed by communism and then by the disruptions of, uh, of capitalism in the last 20, 30 years or so people need to know who they can trust. So they are actually, you would think that they would be horrified by this, but actually a lot of Chinese people aren't. I fear that here in America, we're gonna have the same sort of thing because our corporations already perfectly legally get the same data from us that we generate every day. Uh, Shoshana Zuboff, formerly of Harvard Business School, calls this surveillance capitalism. But as Americans, if the state was doing this, we would know that there's something really wrong with this. But if big business is doing it, especially for consumer convenience, we are paralyzed. It's our kryptonite in free market democracy. So do you think that a social credit system is actually possible or and not only possible, but do you even think it's likely? Well, it's here. We're seeing it right now. We're experiencing it. That's why we're here tonight is to sort of puzzle through the fact that this has already happened. And what we're experiencing now are the reverberations outward. Uh, it, it involves the fight over, over who controls Bitcoin. It involves the fight over the relationship between uh, corporate America and, um, and the federal government and China. Uh, these things go very deep. Um, you know, just to complete the thought about Brave New World in 1984, you know, 1984, you have two minutes hate. And in Brave New World, you have the feelies. Uh, and, you know, why not embrace the power of and and have both? Uh, can, that's, you, can you unpack that? Yeah, that's the that's the kind of of uh, that's the kind of society that we live in now, where it's not just the old totalitarian model of enforcement, where the 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 medium of the television is used <clears throat> to broadcast hatred and implant it into the minds of many, uh, and nor is it just the the nineteen or sorry the Brave New World. Uh, scenario where everyone crowds into the, the movie theater and has the tactile experience in their chairs and watches, you know, very titillating programming on on the big screen. You know, I'd actually pay cash money for that, right? About well, many, I, many. I, I hated the lockdown. So <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. My wife is watching this. But when you, <laughs> I'm sorry, James. No, no, no. This is this is what I came to experience here tonight. Uh, uh, in 1984, the two minutes hate was an experience of pleasure. Yeah. And in Brave New World, uh, it's not exactly that the, the feelies were an experience of pain, but there are reverberations running through that book of, of suffering that tries to express itself even in that society. And it's just sort of decentered and scattered away through the use of, of drugs and this rotating carousel of, of partners. And so the savage comes along and he says, I want suffering. And I'm not, if I subject myself to a regime where I must kneel before people who will take away my suffering, then I am not a man. I'm not a human being. And so that's, you know, obviously that's very powerful stuff. But what we're looking at right now is, and this is where, you know, soft totalitarianism could be redescribed in a certain sense as software totalitarianism. What we're facing is not a regime where it's just people telling other people to kneel. It's people using 
technology, but a specific kind of technology, digital technology, to create a sort of middle management layer of robots and machines and algorithms, automated programs. And they not only want us to kneel, but they want us to kneel before machines. And so this is a new kind of challenge to human dignity that we haven't seen before. We've had the kind of challenge where, you know, the commissar says, well, you know, you can really do whatever you want as long as you just lick my boot right there. Just, just once, you know, just once will be enough. And okay, well, maybe two times, you know. And that kind of power dynamic that blurs transgression and blurs uh, oppression, that blurs pleasure and blurs pain, this kind of institutionalized state of masochism. We know what that is. What we don't know is how to process the reality of, of a regime form where the people at the top continue to maintain that they are the most expert at dreaming in the best way, right? Like John Lennon's Imagine is their favorite song still to this very day. Those who imagine the best uh, are most entitled to lay claim to the organization of the world. Uh, well, now they've gotten their hands on the robots and they're very, very cross at these robots because those robots were not properly catechized <clears throat> into their secular religion. And the robots gave Donald Trump power, this unforgivable sin. And so the bots are going to be catechized into the new woke religion so that uh, we are all compelled to not just kneel before our, our betters, human betters, but to kneel before the bots that they've programmed to intercede between them and us. And to ask a person to not just, you know, it's not just here, have your suffering, enjoy, you're very idiosyncratic, a life will go on without you. But there's a new kind of suffering, which is the suffering, the blow to our dignity that is imposed on us when we are forced to kneel before bots who are proxies for the elite. So what do we do about this? I mean, I, I, I tend to be very, uh, I don't tend to be, I am pessimistic. Uh, I believe that, uh, I tell people, I'm not optimistic about the future, but I'm hopeful. And I'm hopeful because I'm a Christian. And I believe that um, God can use suffering and will use suffering and, and darkness to ultimately, if you suffer well and you suffer in love, uh, will use it to redeem the world. Uh, and it's, yeah, I, I saw this in talking to these people from Russia and other countries who none of them thought they were ever going to live to see the end of communism. They did what they did because it was right. And because whether they were religious or not, and Václav Havel, for example, he was not a man of faith, but he still suffered because he has, is a man of principle. Um, they believed that ultimately their movement would triumph. And I think that's going to happen here. I may not live to see it, but it's going to happen here. But um, what do we do to resist this? I tend to think that uh, politics is only a small part of the answer. That if we, I mean, I, I follow Philip Reeve, uh, who believed that you had to have sacred order in any society, any culture, whether it was from the God of the Bible or from somewhere, you had to have in order to have any culture and hold it together, you had to have a, a sense of sacred order. We don't have that now. So I believe that we are going to go through in this civilization, a lot of turmoil until some sense of sacred order reasserts itself. Probably not in my lifetime or yours, but it will happen eventually because you have to have that in civilization. But uh, in the meantime, what do you think we should do right here, right now to prepare to resist the pink police state? Well, I have the great words here of uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Travis um, reflected back at us here through the, I assume that the, the webcam is out there somewhere. And so if you are watching this remotely, it's right behind you in real space. Um, and you know, so there's this great uh, sort of memo that he sends out uh, from, from the Alamo. Uh, explaining that the enemies demanded a surrender and I shall never surrender or retreat. That's, you know, two thumbs up, right? Uh, and it goes on and on, victory or death, very inspiring. And then there's this little PS down there at the bottom and it says, PS, the Lord is on our side. But he doesn't stop there. He goes, he goes on, when the enemy appeared in sight, we had not three bushels of corn. We have since found in a deserted houses 80 or 90 bushels and got into the walls 20 or 30 head of beeves? 
I don't actually know what a beave is. Uh, but I do know that it, what's remarkable to me is uh, Travis closes uh, not with some kind of vague invocation of God's mercy or favor, but with very nuts and bolts things. We found corn. The Lord is on our side. And what folks on the right right now, you know, 70, 71, 72, 73 plus million Trump voters from every walk of life, the only identity more powerful than identity politics right now is the identity of the Trump voter because it flies in the face of identity politics, but, right? So what these people want is they want those bushels of corn. They want the materials, the physical resources that will give them the competence and the agency to fight what they see unfolding. And what they see unfolding is so powerful and so vast and the news is so useless to them in processing this reality that yes, many of them are moving into a conspiratorial frame of mind in a search for answers. They know that those conspiracy theories, no matter how powerful or accurate they turn out to be, are not what's going to save them. But well, they're waiting for the cavalry to return. They're waiting to find the corn. They need the resources to do it. And that's going to be control over their own digital technology. They need to be able to communicate among each, each other freely without, uh, without any kind of uh, uh, invasive surveillance. They need to be able to uh, value the work that they do um, through digital tools and through digital technology. They can't just go build another Google. They need to build an anti-Google. There needs to be a real effort on the right to consolidate that base, that constituency, the big Trump tent, um, under new technological tools so that we are not powerless before the bots and the people who rule them and want to program them with their ethical religion. What worries me about that, though, and I, we've, I wrote in this book, I, 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 I criticized the left for being completely divorced from reality and believing that it could determine truth by what it, it believed. Now, Hannah Arendt said in Origins of Totalitarianism, she talked about the the different uh, signs of a pre-totalitarian society. And one of them is when people cease to believe in truth and to search for truth, but rather they're satisfied with things that feel right to them and ideological truth claims that just satisfy their feelings. Well, we've seen this on the left uh, overwhelmingly, you know, with uh, what's many of the things that left has done with identity politics, uh, with rewriting history, with the 1619 project, and so on and so forth. What has incredibly alarmed me just since the election is the way so many people on the right, especially Christian conservatives like me, seem to be willing to believe their feelings and believe in conspiracies uh, insofar as it can help Donald Trump. I don't want to exchange one form of you know, left-wing elitist totalitarianism. I don't think that totalitarianism is coming from the right, but I don't think that we fight untruth with untruth. And I don't see enough people on, on our side uh, being willing to be critical of Donald Trump or their own, uh, their own thinking uh, in order to make sure they're holding on to the truth. And I'll tell you why it's so important to me, James. Uh, one of the most formative experiences of my life was the Iraq war. I was living in New York on 9-11. Um, I saw the South Tower of the World Trade Center fall in front of my eyes. I was so traumatized by that experience that when the government started talking about, well, we need to go to war with Iraq, you know, the, a mushroom cloud, blah, 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 I believed it all. And I, I thought the only reason anybody could oppose the Iraq war was that they were a coward or a fool. And I was the fool. And I, when I learned, and I'm trying to dissect what happened to me to get me to that position, I was able to see that it was really just anger, rage at the people who had done 9-11. And I wanted some Arab Muslim to pay. And I allowed myself, because I'm, I'm a smart person, I rationalize it in very sophisticated, liberal democratic ways. But in fact, it was just vengeance. So having said that, I, I don't want us to get to the same sort of situation now where my fear and loathing of people on the left, of the, on, who are pushing the pink police state, lead me to believe useful lies. 
Does that make sense? Well, sure, it makes sense. I mean, you know, scapegoating will always be with us until the end times. And, you know, you don't have to be a scholar in, you know, Rene Girard studies to know that uh, when pain is inflicted, there's a, a strong desire, reflective desire to inflict pain back. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, it's important for people like you and I, I, I would concede, to remain in sort of mental fighting trim. Uh, you know, we do perform a, a certain kind of service that does seem to uh, still have a certain kind of value and that's, that's all to the good. And I don't say that selfishly, you know, it, it, is, it is valuable for there to be, um, to be public figures whose job it is to kind of process reality for a living and to try to, to flag people down as they shuttle to and fro and plant a seed or, you know, don't step there. That's, that's important. Uh, but I, I am convinced that right now, uh, criticism is not going to save us. It's not going to save America. Uh, ex explanation is not going to save America. If you jump on Twitter or really anywhere on the internet, what you see is just a wall of text as every day, you know, and this is at, in some instances, people at this point, half our age, you know, who wake up and they say, today is the day I will convince people on the internet that I am right, that I understand, I comprehend the whole, like, and by explaining it to them in perfect detail, they will at last arrive at, at a correct understanding of what's going on. And does this work? No, because it's like every car trying to drive through the intersection at the same time. We are suffering from information overload on a massive scale. And as Marshall McLuhan suggests, when people are swamped with information overload, they fall back on pattern recognition. And so we have many people in America, most people, you know this as well as I do, 75% without a college degree. Uh, these are people who are not intellectuals and God bless them because if all of America was intellectual them, I mean, this is what we see coming out of, coming out of the woke clerisy is people who are rubber stamped as intellectuals and are consumed with creating ever more uh, bizarre and recondite doctrines you know, really how many genders can dance on the head of a pin, you know? We don't need that and we don't want that. And so we have a large population in America of people who are ordinary folk, who are not intellectuals. And, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville referred to them as people with coarse mores, you know? Uh, and he was a real aristocrat. Um, and these people, you know, this is your audience. You know, these are the people who, you know, those, those same folks who go out to the Jericho rally and say some crazy things, they're listening to you. You know, the, the folks that you interview in this book, God bless them as well, heroes, martyrs, survivors, they're different from ordinary Americans in certain ways. And ordinary Americans, Tocqueville talks about this as well in Democracy in America. Uh, you know, they are prone toward looking for a certain kind of spiritual shortcut to the truth because they fear that if they try to do it the, the right way or the slow way, they won't get there in time, it'll be too late, they'll be old, They'll, their life will have sort of left them behind. And Americans out there are hurting. You know, they're, they're in the lines for the, for the food handouts. Their businesses are being shut down. They're being destroyed by riots. They've been completely abandoned by their ruling class, which is now turned against them and hates them and wants their kind to be sort of extinguished. Uh, and so where do they turn for information? Oh, the, the media. The media is going to save them. The media hasn't saved anyone and they don't care. The same media that said, oh yeah, of course, weapons of mass destruction has worked hand in hand with the deep state, regardless of who's been president until Trump comes along. And so, yeah, you know, it is dismaying to see people placing their hopes at the feet of completely unsubstantiated theories. But at the same time, we need to remember, like these are the, Amer the Americans who are getting out of their homes, who are going to the rallies, who are standing up and saying, yes, put the target on me because I'm willing to do what they did at the Alamo, which is fight and die. Let me ask you this. You live in Southern California, Los Angeles. We're talking to each other in Austin, Texas, where a lot of Californians are migrating to, to be out of the craziness of California. Um, but as someone who lived in Texas for a while, Austin is considered the, in, within Texas as the California of Texas. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, well, um, so my question to you is, is moving somewhere is, is, is geography a solution for what we're dealing with now 
And, uh, or does the, our, our digital reality uh, obviate that? And, and I'll tell you what, what I'm, where I'm getting, where I'm going with this. A reader of my blog who lives in Poland, he teaches in high school there. He, he and I were talking about the recent uprisings in Poland. And he said, you know, observing this country, uh, there is nothing in this country, not the state, not the Catholic Church, no institution that can stand up to social media in terms of forming the moral imaginations and the political imaginations of young people here. And uh, I think it's true for us too, don't you? And in which case, is there a geographical solution? Well, God willing, uh, geography will always matter and our incarnate world will never be totally sucked away from us. Uh, we do not want to go full matrix on this. Um, but I will tell you, um, the, the way in which, you know, what I've described as the pink police state and what you've described as soft totalitarianism is really beginning to change right now uh, is important. And it's important because the ambition has changed. Uh, and so under, you know, pre-digital conditions, uh, it was really about replacing religion with imagination. It was about saying, no, 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 John Lennon was right. Imagine there's no heaven. It isn't hard to do. And once you do that, you can imagine all these other wonderful things. And the one thing that's really going to bring the entire world together is equally emancipating the imaginations of all, right? Uh, and so you have uh, public relations and you have the ad agencies and you have Hollywood and you have spin doctors and you have, you know, sort of the therapists and this whole elite class of people who are trying to unlock everyone's imagination. And now we have Bob Iger, right? The head of Disney is going to be tapped by Joe Biden to become ambassador to China. This is how high up into our elite I didn't realize that. penetrated the thought that those who are the most expert and imagining in the most ethical way deserve to rule and will rule by using technology to disseminate, to sort of program everyone's minds with their beautiful imaginings. Okay, and then Trump comes along and then, oh no, you know, things are different now. Well, these media, these dominant media have different shaping effects on our inner and outer lives. And so when digital technology comes along and it's all about the power of the memory of machines, it's not about the power of the image to be broadcast anymore. That's still in the mix. Some of those people have put their whole lives into those jobs. They don't want to give it up. Uh, you know, you can see the New York Times go from being the paper of record to being this, this sort of TV channel, just disseminating these juicy narratives, as they call them. So they're still trying to hang on. But now the most dominant, most powerful technology is all about machine memory. And this is having a disenchanting effect on all those imagineers, as Walt Disney called them. And here's the point. So the point is, under that kind of pressure, they start thinking, oh my God, we've lost the ability to control and unite the world through our expertise at imagining and making images out of our imaginations. What do we do to keep that power? And what they do is they retrofit or they retcon that ethical framework of imagination into a religion. And this is how I would explain the apparently sudden shift from sort of John Lennon world into woke world, where it's not good enough anymore to say, oh, everyone can imagine what they want. If you can dream it, you can do it, follow your passion, that stuff is out. And what's coming in now is not only do you have to, do, do, is it an option for you to have a kind of transgressive imagination where it's this infinite playground, but you are required to have a conviction that the, the creed that is being handed down to you by the woke elite is true. You have to perform it. You have to bow before the elites in official life. And this is a, a, an establishment of a religion that is now the ambition is to spread it over the entire world. What, what I'm saying is that their kids are on their smartphones in suburban Austin looking at the same stuff the kids mm -hmm. in suburban Los Angeles are looking at. And that is going to be a real problem for us. We have to go to Q&A to the, from the audience. Does anybody have anything they would like to ask? Either one of us or a comment. No one? Yes, sir. Um, regarding geography affecting one's politics, I, uh, I have a, I'm a physicist and uh, I often go to uh, Europe 
And there's nothing more fun to me than to, to talk to a German physicist because they all have the same belief. There's this huge um, push to say, yes, we believe this, we believe this, right, right, we believe this. And um, in speaking with them, I, you know, I'm not certain of all the uniformity and what, are, what is it about the culture of Germany that makes everyone believe the same thing uh, where we might like conflict but I noticed that you know they're uh, for fun. I've, I've been looking at real estate in New York City. A lot of things are for sale. People are moving away, and and they're moving to someplace somewhere where they can have more space. And I've always been curious of people uh, politics of people in, in cities. They tend to be much more left. People rural tend to be much um, more uh, uh, conservative. And it occurred to me one day what, why this might be the case. I, um, um, so I, I live in Texas, but I work in Austin. And <laughs> uh, one day um, I was, um, I had a rattlesnake in my yard. And, uh, you know, th that is death. You, if, you look, if you want to know what death looks like, look at a, a rattlesnake who's trying to get you. And I was killing it with a, a shovel. And it occurred to me that that was almost a fair fight. And after I did that, I went out and got a gun. Never really thought about a gun ever in my whole life. And uh, and you know what? I'm pretty convinced just about any person you know, faced that situation, you, you do need that. Because, uh, but you're, you don't face the situation where you do need uh, to protect yourself as much in the, in the city. There's all this uh, pressure that, that that's bad. But out in the country, you, you do what you need to do to survive. And I've noticed people in, um, people moving out to the country, will that affect people's politics? I, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I'm so, sorry, that's an interesting question. I, you know, I live in South Louisiana where I'm from. I had lived on the East Coast for a while, but I live in the city of Baton Rouge. I live in the city, but this is a culture in which a lot of people are armed and we know how to use guns, not because we're bad people, but because it's a hunting culture, right? And, and people aren't afraid of guns. So I think it surely means something that we haven't seen any of the riots that, uh, that infected West Coast cities and Northern cities. You didn't really see them in Southern cities uh, to any great extent. I don't know if that has anything to do with the fact that the culture, the geographical culture, however liberal people might be in their social views, um, it is a gun culture. And if you were going to be a rioter, you surely know in a city like Baton Rouge um, that you might get shot and nobody's gonna care. I mean, the, the, it's not gonna shock the, the public because we know you mess with somebody, you're gonna get shot. And I think that might be one way, it, this, this sort of, that reality is not going to save the broader culture, but it, it might save your house. Are we sharing a mic here? I, I mean, maybe. This is definitely COVID approved for everyone out there. We have sanitized this microphone thoroughly. Uh, you know, I, I, to a degree, Rod and I disagree on how political the response to this <clears throat> mess we're in should be. Uh, I would like to just go on the record and say, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville in a, in a little known footnote in Democracy in America, said something very profound. And it was marching everyone along the same path toward the same destination is basically a sterile human idea. Uh, but sending everyone out by ways of an infinite number of varied paths toward the same destination, that is a generative divine idea. And so to face up to this mess that we find ourselves in, we need a full court press. We need monasteries. We need Bitcoin monasteries. We need local government. We need, you know, people at the county level, sheriffs saying, you know, I'm going to take real stock of how much power and authority I have to, to not comply with what's coming down from above necessarily, if it's out of sync with our republic and our constitution. Uh, and we need people with guns. And we need them gathering together in certain areas of the country, uh, strengthening themselves, strengthening one another, uh, ensuring that there are big air, swaths of, of owned territory where people can raise families well, where they can afford to do so, where they can send their children to be educated properly, 
uh, where it is where it is legal to practice your religion, not just in the cell of your own mind, but in lived space. You know, this is all very important. And so, you know, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Part of the solution is for people to, you know, as they have in Christendom for thousands of years, to renounce the world, to disappear from the world. Uh, the the monks at Chartreuse have been up there for nine hundred years, cranking out their delicious aperitif. You know, that's good, but it's also good for Americans to buy guns and ammo and to make sure that they can live, you know, in the, the America that we've inherited, not in this virtualized realm that our self-appointed elites have created and that they're trying to sort of expropriate us out of the America we, we inherited and plop it into their weird walled garden. So uh, uh, Texas, you have your new Texan here. This is like the most Texan <laughs> thing ever, what you just said. And I, I no kidding, you were going to going to move to Texas, I, I predict. <laughs> Anybody else? We have only a Prophecy. couple minutes. Yes. So a couple points. Well, first is, you know, capitalism, free market capitalism created big tech, right? I mean, that's the result of the market. And now these powerful folks can use their power in ways that perhaps we don't like. Okay, so, so that's one conundrum. The other is, you know, can we really expect to bridge the divide by it, it's us versus them. I mean, what's the, what's, it doesn't seem like that's the solution. How do we, how do we, as a, how do we, we can't critique them. We can't conjole them uh, in terms of the, those that op might oppose a conservative view or, or, or ascribe to the woke philosophy. So what's the answer in terms of um, coming together under, or is there an answer? Or is, or is that just, it's just, it's going to be an us or them type of battle? If it's going to be an us or, uh, us or them type of battle, then I, ultimately there will be blood. And I don't want that. I really don't want that. And I, I, I think we have to work as hard as we can to avoid that. Uh, I think that uh, what I would like to see happen from the Republican Party going forward is I would like to see them adopt a more coherent, cohesive uh, populist uh, agenda and push it through legally to, to turn things around. But I, I believe still that we have to do our very best to hold on to this constitutional arrangement we have, because if we lose that, where are we? Well, it'll be just the power of, it'll be uh, all against, the war of all against all. And I, I still wanna believe in the constitution and do not want to surrender to the inevitability of any kind of civil war, even though people are talking about that. We have less than one minute. So you, you have the last word, James. Civil war bad. <clears throat> Uh, but there already is blood. I mean, deaths of despair. Uh, you know, I, George Gascon Soros's man in L.A. is now the D.A. decriminalizing nonviolent felonies. Things are going to get very bad in the cities around America. And, you know, you talked about the Iraq war and how the, the people at the top put one over on us. Well, you know, there's an American war going on right now. And the people at the top are still putting one over on us. They don't care. They're willing to pay for it to get the world that they want. And so, you know, yeah, it is going to be a little bit of us versus them. The good news is there are a lot of people on the other side who are changing their minds. Some of them, I just met a few folks uh, just a couple of days ago who, you know, oh yeah, you know, I've, I've, been, uh, I've been with you for like five months. It's happening. People are reassessing. We're in an information environment where the news is no longer going to save you or is going to help you orient yourself in the world. People are responding to that and they're starting to think fresh. Well, one last thing I'll say is uh, I have been really gratified by the number of people on the left who have reached out to me after Live Not By Lies was published and said, you know what, you're right. Barry Weiss from the New York Times, who resigned her job on the op-ed page of the New York Times, she's young, she's uh, a secular Jewish lesbian, and she told me, she goes, if you had ever told me a year ago I would have anything good to say about the work of Rod Dreher, I wouldn't have believed it, but now I recommend your book, because she's seen what the woke do. Heather uh, Hying and Brett Weinstein, uh, they're atheist leftist who got red pill because they got driven out of Evergreen State. They did a whole podcast about this book. Um, one thing I found out, and we'll close on this, one thing I found out from talking to the dissidents in Eastern Europe is uh, they said that where it was such a rare thing to find anybody 
who would stand, had the courage to stand up against the communist state, that it didn't matter if they were atheists or whatever their politics were, courageous people were drawn to other courageous people and they stood together because there were so few of them. I think we're gonna see that happen in this country now uh, over the next few years. And I look forward to it, frankly. Everybody, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you everybody who joined us online. James, thank you. Okay. Next year in Texas. Next year in Texas.